Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Tuesday, June 18th, 2024 meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. My name is Donna Scalia. I'm the chair of the commission and the director of public works. Uh, Beth, if you are ready, if you could please call the roll. We got to unmute you, Beth. All right, Beth, I think we're either having trouble hearing you or maybe it's just me, I'm not sure. I can't hear. Okay. All right, Beth, we're having some audio issues. Do you want me to do the roll? Yeah, why don't you, um, why not, Beth, we may have to have you uh, disconnect and reconnect, but um, Let's uh, let's see maybe if her microphone, I don't know if there's something obvious or, um, sorry, it's not working for some reason. So just bear with us guys. Beth, can you hear us? Yeah, I don't think she can hear us at all. I can text her. All right, sorry for the technical difficulties. Just bear with us for a second. I can talk, can you hear me? Yep, yes. there we go. Can you hear us? But I cannot hear you. Do you have something you can turn your speakers up louder? Yeah, maybe what we need to do is um, just get an open phone line, um, and that might that might do it. Maybe you can call in Beth, or I can try and get try out and go back in again. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to do the roll call while? Yeah, why don't we? Um, why don't you see if you can call the roll so we can get going and. Um, but can you, Cindy, can you just make Diana a uh, a co-host? Yes. Yep. Sorry, Diana. <clears throat> okay. Donna Lascalia? Here. John Cartledge? Here. Nancy Forrestal? Here. Carolyn Mish? Here. Alex Jarrett. Here. Deborah Pastrick Clemmer. Here. Diana Foskett. Here. Adam Novit. Here. Jamie Albro Fisher. Here. Devin Bruce. Here. And Maggie's here. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Sure, everybody's here. Yeah, Beth is in. Let's see, mm -hmm. maybe if she, her technical difficulties are resolved. If, uh... All right. I also should have mentioned that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Beth. Can you hear us? Nope. All right, so Cindy, I'm going to continue with the meeting. Maybe if you're um, talking, Donna. I can't hear you. I can yeah. see that you're talking. Yeah, yeah, just hold on. Cindy, if you could um, maybe go offline and just work through the technical difficulties with Beth and maybe get her to call in, um, that, that might resolve the situation. Otherwise, she'll just have to do it off the recording. OK, thank you. All right, so we'll proceed. And again, my apologies for the um, 
uh, for the technical difficulties. Um, so first off, I will ask if there is any public comment. Um, if you are here to speak on an agenda item, I would ask uh, you to hold your comment until we get to that place uh, in the agenda. Um, and if you're here to speak on a topic that's not on the agenda, you are welcome to do so now. Um, so if anyone would like to raise their hand, I will recognize you um, if you're here to speak on a non-agenda related item. So I see- uh, I now hear you. You got us now, Beth? I got you now. Excellent, glad that's resolved. Thank you. Um, thank you to both of you for resolving that. Okay, so Shelby, I see your actual hand um, and I am going to ask you to unmute. So go ahead, I just need your name and city or town or residence, please. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm commenting on an agenda item. I heard uh -oh. that I should wait, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, anyone here to comment on a non-agenda item? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of minutes from the previous meeting, which was May 21st, 2024. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Devin moves yes and wants to say Beth did a great job on that set. Do I have a second? I second. I'll second that. Who was that? I'm sorry, was that Carolyn? Sure. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, give it to, we'll give it to Carolyn as the second, so. And I will um, I will second uh, Devin's comment that Beth did do a good job on the minutes. So thank you, Beth. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, Beth, if you could call the roll for us, please. Uh, DPW Director Donna Lascalia. Yes. Uh, Police Department Chief John Cartledge. Yes. Planning and Sustainability Director Carolyn Mish. I can't hear you, Carolyn. Carolyn, you're muted. Uh, yes, sorry, I <laughs> muted too fast after that. Parking Administration Enforcement, Nancy Forrestall. Yes. Counselor Alex Jarrett. Yes. Counselor Deborah Clemmer. Yes. Adam Novit. Uh, yes. Devin Bruce. Yes. Diana De Foskett. Yes. And Jamie Elbro Fisher. Yes. Unanimous with 10. Okay, thank you, Beth. Okay, next up is reports from departments and subcommittee. I have a few updates from the DPW. So our paving contractor um, is expected to mobilize in July. So we've talked at length about the areas to be repaved. Just as a refresher, they are the roundabout by Look Park. And we're actually gonna be doing some nighttime work there and there will be detours. We will communicate that out when the time comes, but it will be uh, slightly disruptive. Uh, we're gonna be paving on Spring Street, Loudville Road, North Elm Street, North Maple Street, Chestnut Street, Burt's Pit Road, and Dana Street. We will also be doing sidewalk reconstruction as part of this project. Um, and we will also be uh, installing uh, several speed humps in uh, various areas, uh, Meadow Street included, um, which has also been uh, discussed at this commission. Um, the Adair Place outfall restoration is ongoing. The rail trail is closed from Jackson Street to Stoddard Street until July 31st. The detour is in place via Prospect Street. Smith College pedestrian improvement. Smith College uh, has generously donated $200,000 to the city to both study and improve the corridor around Route 66, uh, on Route 66 and Route 9 around their campus. Um, and we are just about to execute a contract um, to install five RRFBs uh, in that corridor at various uh, crosswalks. So we thank Smith College for their generosity and the contractor um, we'll be mobilizing uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, pavement markings, as we do every summer, um, we will be restriping the entire city. The work is out to bid. Um, for um, the counselors on the meeting, um, you probably get a lot of comments about um, our striping activities. We have to wait until we sweep. We can't be striping on top of like debris from the winter. So um, we can't you know, restripe like in April, we have to give our street sweepers an opportunity to get out and um, and, and get the dirt off before we can sweep. 
uh, or before we can stripe rather. Um, and then there are a couple of uh, ongoing mass DOT projects, um, the uh, uh, reconstruction of the I-91 bridges um, and Damon Road. Just a couple of comments on Damon Road. The railroad will be closing Damon Road in its entirety with a suspension of rail service um, in July. Um, I actually have a call with Mass DOT this Friday to go over the specifics of that. It's going to be a hard closure of Damon Road with no through traffic at all allowed um, for a period of, of a week. Um, that's what they're anticipating um, at the rail crossing. Um, so it is going to be disruptive. There will be detours in place. Mass DOT is managing this as well as the communication. So it will be communicated out widely. Um, and I will make sure that the council is um, aware of what the plans are and what the duration is, um, that they, th those plans have not yet been finalized. And there is some conversation around what we're gonna do with truck traffic and how we're gonna be directing folks. Um, so those details are to be worked out with Mass DOT towards the end of the week. So those are all of my updates. I don't know if uh, Carolyn has anything for us. Um, I have a couple, thanks Donna. Um, so one, just I think at the last meeting, I noted that we were still waiting for MassDOT to release the 75% design plans for the Main Street redesign. Um, they've done that where we've posted them now on the website. So we are working towards that next phase of really fine grain detail um, towards 100% plans. Um, we have um, another uh, a project that has been so slow in coming and it continues to plot along. I know people have been asking about the um, Rocky Hill Greenway phase one extension and when that construction is going to start, MassDOT put that off um, for a while. We're working through a re um, a sort of reallocation of right of way and easements um, and so we had to redo some of that work along Route 66, but basically the bottom line is that MassDOT's planning um, to bid that project in early 25, so construction really won't be till next year. Um, on um, the another project in design is uh, that's been on hold for a little bit, but we're hoping to move forward this summer our construction or designs for bus stops at various locations um, with our through our block grant funding process we're looking at making the bus stops around town that we can make um, accessible so many of those stops are just sort of planted in the grass with their curb um, between it and the street and so we've been looking at sort of key um, stations along the Elm Street corridor, Barrett Street, um, Bridge Street, Jackson Street, so that's moving ahead. And then finally, um, just today, we've opened up the um, parking area. This isn't a transportation and parking issue exactly, but it is parking um, for the Broadbrook um, Greenway um, at the Fitzgerald Lake entrance off of Cook Avenue. So that parking is finished and um, reopened for the public. And that's all. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Any other members of the commission have any updates for us? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to matters before the commission. First up is in order to install temporary always stop control at Hatfield and Cook Avenue. Um, so I will read the order and then ask Maggie to put the, um, the map up on the screen and then offer an explanation. Um, and again, there will be opportunity for, um, for the public who's on here to comment on this um, after we get through the explanation. So this is in order to install a temporary all-way stop control at Hatfield Street and Cook Avenue. Whereas the Department of Public Works hired the engineering firm Fuss and O'Neill to conduct a stop sign safety study in the fall of 2023, Fuss and O'Neill recommended the Hatfield Street at Cook Avenue intersection be converted to an all-way stop controlled intersection based on traffic volume and intersection site distance at the intersection. Whereas Cook Avenue currently has stop signs in the north and south directions of travel at the intersection with Hatfield Street, whereas section 312-16 in the code of ordinances allows experimental regulations 
for the purpose of trial, the city council may make temporary rules regarding traffic or test under actual conditions, signs, markings, or other devices. No such experimental rules relating to traffic shall remain in effect for a period longer than 120 days. Now, therefore, be it ordered that an always stop controlled intersection be established at the intersection of Hatfield Street and Cook Avenue for a trial period of 120 days to observe traffic cues. Um, and then I'll ask Maggie, um, I can't see the screen, but if you could just get that map up so that folks can see. Um, so uh, just a little background on this before I ask for a motion. Um, we get a lot of requests for stop signs throughout the city. We hire our uh, traffic engineering firm, Fuss and O'Neill, to assess them and then issue a report um, so that that way we have uh, data-driven decisions. So in this case, Fuss and O'Neill conducted uh, stop sign uh, safety assessment at this intersection and several others in the fall of 2023. And what we asked them to look at were the conditions at this intersection and determine what improvements, if any, were warranted. Um, so we've uh, implemented stop signs at several other intersections this were, that were part of this report. And this is the last intersection on which we have taken no action that was included in that report. Um, so we had them look at crash history. We had them look at peak traffic flows. We had them take field measurements of the intersection site distances and the stopping site distances. And we had them make field observations on the posted speed limits, site characteristics, driver behavior. Um, so right now, Hatfield Street is a two-way stop controlled intersection. So if you're coming down Cook Avenue, you have to stop traffic free flows on Hatfield Street. So Fuss and O'Neill's recommendations were that the intersection be converted to an all-way stop controlled intersection. And it is based on the traffic volume and what's called the ISD or the intersection site distance at the intersection. So ISD is um, uh, an acronym that's used to describe the perception and reaction times needed to identify an appropriate gap in oncoming traffic, which then allows a vehicle to safely turn onto the road and accelerate without you know, causing an accident. Like, okay, can I go? Is it safe for me to pull into, into traffic? Um, and it was Bustin O'Neill's opinion um, that what they observed uh, warranted the installation of a stop sign. So they've also recommended they've also recommended that we add stop bars as part of the stop sign installation um, and put them closer to improved uh, sight lines. Again, we don't want people stopping way back um, so that they can't uh, see um, when they're trying to pull out. Um, there was a recommendation that we trim some vegetation on the southeast corner, which I'll talk about a little more. Councillor Moulton and I have had uh, uh, some conversation around this. Um, and notably, Fuss and O'Neill also recommended that we further study the intersection to determine if a traffic signal might be warranted here. So um, I have uh, uh, just a little bit of other information that I'd like to share um, before I stop talking. Um, in that we have received um, an outpouring of um, communication from residents uh, in this area who have noted um, the unsafe traffic conditions and trying to pull off of Cook Avenue onto Hatfield Street. We acknowledge the heavy traffic volumes in the area and we also acknowledge um, that there are um, uh, an undesirable level of crashes at the intersection. And that was, of course, part of Fuss and O'Neill's um, analysis was to look at crash history. Um, I will also mention that MassDOT had planned um, for a TIP project um, that was to construct a roundabout at the intersection of North King and Hatfield Street um, and that project actually went to bid. It was awarded to a contractor. Um, we were actually gonna replace our water line as part of it. Um, and the project was scuttled due to uh, controversy as I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, the unfortunate byproduct of the scuttling of that project was that improvements that were to be made to this intersection by MassDOT were not made. Um, and that has put us in the position where we now 
um, feel that we need to do something to try to um, alleviate the burden on drivers here. So that is um, the backstory, and that is an explanation of the recommendation. I'm wondering if Chief Cartledge could um, just say a couple of words about um, the accidents that he has seen at this intersection, if you could, Chief. Yes, certainly. Um, we did a five-year collision analysis. Um, it was conducted, this was asked for on August 28th of 2023. During the five-year assessment period, there were 14 collisions reported. Um, two of the 14 collisions involved a single car and 12 involved two cars. Uh, four of them involved were uh, personal injury accidents. I'll just give some of the notable collisions that we recorded. Um, one vehicle facing north on Cook Avenue and stopped at the stop sign, pulled out in front of a vehicle traveling west on Hatfield Street. The second, a vehicle facing south on Cook Avenue and stopped at the stop sign, pulled out in front of a vehicle uh, traveling west on Hatfield Street. Um, let's see, vehicle traveling west on Hatfield Street, slowed to turn left on Cook Avenue and was rear-ended by a vehicle that had been behind them. Uh, vehicle traveling north on Cook Avenue failed to stop at the stop sign, collided with a vehicle traveling west on Hatfield Street. Vehicle facing north on Cook Avenue and stopped at the stop sign, pulled out in front of a vehicle traveling east on Hatfield Street. And lastly, a vehicle facing south on Cook Avenue stopped at the stop sign, pulled out in front of a vehicle traveling east on Hatfield Street. Um, the analysis indicated that some of the operators are not seeing stop signs or failing to stop. Other drivers are stopping, pulling out in front of vehicles driving on Hatfield Street. Um, and those are some of the major things that we saw during this analysis period. Thanks, Chief. And and I think our takeaway and plus and O'Neill's takeaway is we just need to slow everything down in this corridor um, so that uh, folks can make safer turning movements. Um, so just a couple of points of clarification. Um, an important one is why are we doing a temporary stop sign instead of a permanent one? And the answer to that is that we have significant traffic volumes on Hatfield Street. Um, relative to Cook Avenue. We actually have a 10 to one ratio or a nearly 10 to one ratio of cars traveling up and down Hatfield versus cars uh, on Cook, meaning for every uh, 10 cars that go by on Hatfield Street, there is one car on Cook Avenue trying to make a movement. Um, so with that said, we have some level of concern that there will be queuing at this intersection on Hatfield Street that is undesirable and actually disruptive. Uh, Fuss and O'Neill does have a way to measure this. It's actually a metric where you can measure sort of the disruption and wait time. And their opinion is that we were under um, that metric where it would be sort of an unbearable delay. However, um, we think it wisest to try this on a trial basis um, to determine if we need to do further expl exploration um, of something at this intersection, you know, a roundabout is not going to fit here. Um, it, it's just the, the geometry does not support a roundabout. So you'd be looking at a traffic signal um, and that is a huge cost to the city. Um, so the thought um, from the engineering firm, which I'm bringing to the commission today, is that this is a fairly inexpensive temporary trial to try to relieve um, the, the sort of safety issues in the area. Um, and then we will have Fuss and O'Neill return as soon as the uh, stop signs, the temporary stop signs are installed to uh, take new traffic measurements, take new traffic counts, make further observations. We'll certainly solicit community feedback um, and we will see, you know, is the traffic queuing absolutely unbearable? Um, and, and do we need to think of other options? So that is the reason for um, a temporary installation uh, instead of a permanent one, because we don't want to do something that is actually going to be disruptive um, to traffic in a negative way. So um, those are my comments, and I will uh, open it up to any members of the public. Or Councillor Moulton, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Director Lascalia. Uh and good afternoon, everyone. Stan Moulton, Ward 1 City Council. I live at 34 Perkins Avenue. 
I'm here to support both the uh, the proposed uh, remedy uh, at this very dangerous intersection of a four-way stop, as well as uh, Director Laskaya's recommendation that this uh, be a trial run. Uh, this has been the sub. This intersection has been the subject of many conversations I've had with. Uh, neighbors on Cook Avenue, Hatfield Street, Pines Edge over the last uh, two and a half years that I've been on the council. Uh, the concerns <clears throat> that I've heard anecdotally uh, are verified by the Fuss in O'Neill report. Uh, there is uh, a heavy traffic volume on Hatfield Street. There is uh, Fuss and O'Neill uh, noted some excessive speeds uh, uh, on Hatfield, particularly from motorists who are coming off of uh, North King Street. That uh, volume combined with the, uh, the poor sight distances uh, from Cook Avenue, particularly southbound on Cook Avenue, uh, where they are uh, both for left and right turns are uh, less than uh, the distances recommended by the DOT. Uh, make for a very, very dangerous situation there. And I appreciate Chief Cartledge's um, uh, description of some of the accidents that have occurred. Uh, my concern as well as uh, that of residents of this uh, neighborhood is that uh, eventually there could be a very serious or fatal crash there. So I I support uh, the four-way stop, and I understand uh, the concerns that have been raised about the potential queuing on Hatfield Street. Uh, Director Laskaya, and I appreciate her involving me in several conversations about the best remedy for this intersection. Uh, and I also discussed the possibility that traffic will be pushed elsewhere. Will there be unintended consequences? So I think a trial run uh, is a good idea. I'll support that uh, on the council. Uh, and I and I believe that uh, the director of the sky and I agreed that doing that trial run um, in the fall would be better to get a truer picture than the summer when uh, schools are not in session, people are away. So that's why uh, she is recommending the uh, September through December uh, period for the trial run. So I uh, appreciate all of what uh, of what she said, and I appreciate this being included in the uh, studies of various intersections. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. And yeah, by the time this winds its way through the council process, um, we will we will likely be into the fall uh, for implementation. We do need to be mindful that we are under um, uh, deadlines, so we will have to move quickly um, to both install the stop signs and study them so that we can sort of stay within our, our timing. Um, Nancy, I see your hand up, go ahead. Well, thank you, Donna, for your careful approach to this and your informed approach to this. Um, with this heavy um, traffic volume, I'm concerned um, about getting the word out, uh, especially when we're changing the dynamics around a, a busy intersection. What types of um, outreach will go out to the public to make sure that uh, the word is out there that there is a change? And will there be any kind of electric sign boards? You know, what kind of a message are you going to be putting out there? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you. Um, so we're having this difficulty with the installation of uh, stop signs that were also part of this report on uh, Riverside. Um, and and I, I know Councillor Jarrett is eagerly awaiting um, that stop sign. Um, the city does not own electronic message boards. We borrow them from the state for particular events. Um, and we borrow them for very finite time periods. Um, we have uh, one in use uh, for Strong Avenue right now, but we share them with other agencies in the region. Um, so because people travel at a very high rate of speed down Hatfield Street, we want to be very careful that this is well marked. Um, I actually just ordered a pile of construction barrels um, with flashing lights on top. Um, so likely what we will do is run construction barrels down the double yellow center line on the approaches to this intersection on Hatfield Street. And then we will have advanced signage. Um, we will paint stop bars in the street. Um, and 
you know, I will have to see what, if anything, I can do with an electronic signboard, but it is extremely narrow through there. And I don't even have anywhere to put it. I, I mean, I've sort of driven up down the road, you know, kind of contemplating where I could get a sign in there. So I think our best bet is going to be a very intentional narrowing of the road with construction barrels. Like I said, I just ordered a a trailer load of them. Um, and we're just going to shrink the road right down. Um, and then of course we'll ask Councillor Moulton to, um, uh, to communicate this out via his newsletter. Um, you know, the challenge is I think the residents will know what's happening. It's the pass through traffic that may not. Um, so certainly open for suggestions, but physical things in the road make people slow down rather than messaging and signage. Um, go ahead, Chief, do you have a comment on that? We can certainly have a cruiser at some point, you know, try to sit there for a while. We did that at um, Florence Road and Burt's Pit when they first put the four-way stop sign there. So we can try to help out with some sort of uh, visual aid with a cruiser if that's helpful. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Appreciate that. Yeah, we did that up at uh, Pine and Maple, too. So, um, okay, at this point, I think I'd like to open it up to comments from the public. Um, so just ask for your name and city or town of residence, um, and I will unmute you. Kim is first, so bear with us. We'll unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Kim. Okay, um, I just want, first of all, thank you for paying attention to this. We we did witness a fatality there many <clears throat> years ago at that intersection. Um, so this has been a problem. I live on uh, Pines Edge Drive, so I'm coming south on Cook every day, and it's really scary. <clears throat> um, and I had the same concerns as Nancy about letting people know and of course, one of the issues is that very few people travel 30 miles an hour on that stretch of Hatfield, which is the speed limit. So a cruiser is great once in a while, um, but if most people are going 35, 40, you know, coming off of routes five and 10. So I'm wondering about those, you know, electronic um, signs telling you how fast you're going. I know you don't have the other kinds of electronic signs. I don't know if the city has those signs because we've got to slow people down. Otherwise, they're going to come down Hatfield Street and be really surprised that there's a stop sign there. And it's like you said, it's the people coming from outside. It's a shortcut. So um, I'm wondering about the speed, how you can help with the speed. Yeah, thank you. Shelby, go ahead. Hi, my name is Shelby uh, von Rosenbach. I live on Emily Lane. And I just wanted to chime in that like super supportive of this four-way stop. Um, but also just note, like I don't think it was talked about yet that a crosswalk would be a really important piece of this if you're already gonna do all this work. Um, this is a two cul-de-sac neighborhood it's not a ton of children, but there's, I think there's gonna be probably a fair amount of turnover in the next 10 years based on the population. And I think there's probably at least 20 kids between the houses right now. And we're within a mile of Jackson Street. So it'd be nice to give these kids the option to safely walk to their neighborhood school um, and have some independence when they get old enough. She's not quite old enough right now, I don't think. Um, but uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to voice my support and add that doing all of this without adding a crosswalk, I think would be a mistake in the end. And I think that it, it, the disruption on, on um, Hatfield does seem like it would be in Hatfield. Yeah, it seems like it would be intense. I think a signal would be a better, like a triggered by traffic coming across would be a better use of everyone's time and resources. Um, but I appreciate the temporary option and hope y'all can help give our kids on this side of the neighborhood a little bit of independence someday being able to cross that without us worrying every moment that they're gone <laughs> um yeah. beyond the make that you. box behind big Y. thank you sure thank you okay next is joanne
Hello. Hello, Joanne. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, I, I'd like to speak in support of the stop signs. Uh, uh, there, I heard consideration of the traffic and vehicles and drivers. Um, I am a pedestrian. Um, and so I cross, uh, I'm on Cook Avenue crossing Hatfield. Um, it's not safe to walk on Hatfield to the east or the west. Um, so the, the, the walking path must be crossing uh, the, uh, Hatfield. Um, and in terms of the population that um, are my, of my fellow walkers and, and bike riders, um, there's the residents on Cook Avenue and, and Emily Lane, um, but also the Laurel Apartments, uh, the Pine, Pine's Edge condos, uh, as well as the new houses that are uh, will be built uh, up by the entry to the Broadbrook Coalition. Um, and in terms of people uh, it, walking or riding the same path I am uh, to access Broadbrook, but also to walk out, you know, anywhere. Um, but also the, I think it's important to note that the bus stops uh, for this whole population that I mentioned, um, those bus stops are at uh, Big Y and Walmart. Um, and so there's, uh, it, 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 I speak in, in concern about the uh, safety of, of the bikers and the, and the walkers crossing that road. Um, and I know that there's, some issue about whether crosswalks could be put on on this at this intersection. But apart from that, you, there are pedestrians um, walking in this in, on on the sidewalks here, um, and so uh, definitely in support of the stop signs. And and I thank you all for your good work. Thank you, Joanne. Would you mind just sharing your last name with us for the record, please? Oh, Joanne Bowen. Bowen, B O W E N. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, next is Betty. Hi, my name Hi. is Betty Petrosic. I live at 307 Hatfield Street. On your map, I have the little red car. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with this intersection. I live this intersection. And I really do am grateful that something's being done. I have been along with other members in this community have been pestering our councilmen and sometimes the police about the accidents that happen here and not safe for kids. It's awful. I have a little dog. I would love to walk my dog on my street. I can't. Anyway, back to my only concern, two concerns I have is the tractor trailers. Them coming through this intersection is going to be a nightmare if you've got a four-way stop there. And the other thing is, this is a ambulance, um, police, fire lane, state police come zipping through here all the time. And if they come through with their sirens and they want everybody to get out of the way, there ain't nowhere to go because the lane, the road is so small, so narrow. So I have concerns about this, but I am glad for the attention. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Okay, next is Kim. Hello. Hello, Kim. Go ahead. Hi, I live on Pines Edge Drive. I'm Kimberly Lambert, and I am very, very thankful that this is being put in the works. I appreciate all the work you've done, and I appreciate all my neighbors who have spoken up and worked on this over the last 30 years. Um, I agree with Nancy. I think electric signboards, if we can get them on each end, would be very helpful maybe two or three weeks before to notify the public that stop signs will be coming so they can start being aware of it and get ready. Um, I, too, have seen accidents at that corner. I have to say I don't agree with the other, Kim, that people are going at 35 miles an hour I think it's more like 50 miles an hour when they come off North King Street and they don't slow down by the time they get to our intersection. Also, coming from Bridge Road, they're going up a hill and they're going pretty quickly. They're going well beyond the 30 miles an hour. So that's a big concern. I think someone suggested the, I think it was Kim suggested the 
speed signs that show your speed. I think that's a good idea to help people be more aware of the speed they're traveling when they start to approach that intersection. The barrels are a great idea for narrowing. Um, and a crosswalk, yes. And it's not only the kids that are walking, but a lot of older people are trying to cross the street. And a lot of us don't bother to walk down to the store because it's too dangerous to cross that intersection. We get in our cars, even though we're just like a few thousand feet up the road and drive to Walmart and Big Y. So, and there'll be more people using that intersection when the housing is built on Bridge Road and the housing is built at the end of Cook Ave. So thanks for everybody for attending this meeting and speaking and um, great job. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll just uh, respond to a couple of the comments. So these comments are very helpful for us um, as we determine, you know, how to implement something like this. So just a couple of comments first about the speed. Um, we're very mindful of the implementation of this, even as a temporary measure and the rate of speed at which cars are traveling. Um, it, regarding the electric signboards, as I mentioned, the city does not own any. So these are sort of short term borrowings that would have to be done from the state. Um, and I have to be mindful of kind of the mathematical width of the road there. Um, we will certainly look to see if it's possible to install an electronic signboard, but there simply isn't a lot of room. And we've got like a, a kind of a hill um, in the inbound um, side, if you will, you know, headed towards Bridge Road. Um, so we will certainly do what we can to, ad to advance Warren folks uh, of the change. Um, but I think that barrels are probably going to be our best option. Regarding the comment about the um, emergency vehicles moving through the area, um, I will note that this is one of our concerns. Um, the queuing applies to them as well. Um, so, you know, when we have now removed or we are suggesting that we remove the free flow of traffic, um, so everybody's going to be caught in the queue, um, cars, tractor trailers, and um, potentially emergency response vehicles. And whether there's a stop sign there or a traffic signal there, um, it's going to be the same phenomenon. So that's something we're going to be looking for feedback from public safety agencies um, to talk to us about what their experience is there. And that's why we're doing this as a trial. Um, so those are, and then um, also just a couple words about crosswalks. So part of the Mass DOT project that was going to install a roundabout um, on North King Street was actually going to make significant improvements to this intersection. It was going to in, um, install uh, raised crosswalks and a sidewalk. Um, and, and again, that project was scuttled and with it, all of those improvements were scuttled. Um, Mass DOT is contemplating a project in the future. Um, but that is not something that is in the near future. It's something that's in the distant future. Um, so we can't come through and paint crosswalks unless there are sidewalks and compliant curb ramps. So I hear the calls for pedestrian access and I agree with them and I support them, um, but the infrastructure is not in place for us to install crosswalks um, in this area. And we would have to actually undertake a fairly significant um, roadway reconstruction project in order to get those compliant ramps, those compliant sidewalks um, installed, and then get a compliant crossing installed. I believe that a stop controlled intersection, um, trialing this is the first step in that direction. Um, okay, I see another hand. So Robert, we'll unmute you, go ahead. Hello? Hello, go ahead, Robert. Uh, my name is Robert Boynton. I live on Emily Lane. Um, I've been here for about 40 years. So we've been a long time trying to get something done here. So thank you very much for trying this trial. We really appreciate it because it has been a dangerous intersection. And there has been a fatality about 25 years ago with uh, a van driver of a, of a small school bus was uh, killed, unfortunately, in this intersection. Um, I'm really concerned about the speed coming down on uh, Hatfield Street from North King Street. 
uh, because they do come 40, 50 miles an hour because I do this intersection every morning when I go to work and I have to take a left and it's the left look left and just go fast because you don't know what's going to be on your tail. So I'm very concerned that this temporary stop signs, people are still going to be rushing through there and there's going to be even more accidents until uh, they are used to this. The second concern I'm concerned about is the uh, lot of tandem trailer, semi-trailer trucks coming out of Walmart and uh, making that turn. Um, are we going to have enough room with all these cars backed up at a stop sign to allow the tractor trailers to go through? Um, but anyway, thank you for attending and doing this. I really appreciate all your efforts on trying to make this a safer city and a safer intersection. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And your comments on the tractor trailers are noted and are something that we will be watching very closely. And again, um, for all these reasons, um, that that's why we're moving this as a, a temporary um, installation rather than a permanent one. All right, any comments from the commission or um, questions on this? So I don't believe we have a motion on the floor. So I would ask for a motion for a positive recommendation on this uh, so moved. ordinance. Thank you, Councilor Jarrett. Do we have a second? Debin I'm seconds. Second. Okay, Debin gets the second. Um, and just a follow-up comment for Councilor Moulton. Um, I, the uh, bush at the corner of Cook and Hatfield is on private property. Um, so there is um, a, a kind of a sight line issue with a, a pretty good sized hedge um, in the area. So trimming vegetation on private property that's blocking sight lines is sort of a vexing issue citywide. Um, so I did just want to follow up on um, that is not within the public right of way. It is on private property, but sort of um, uh, creating difficulty within the private uh, within the public right of way. Um, so, uh, Councilman Moulton, go ahead. So, so uh, Director Lascaia, thank you for that information. I'm happy to follow up uh, with the property owner as we have discussed. If you want to send me a email with uh, with their contact information, I will do that. Sure. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Jarrett, I think I saw your actual hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just curious if the zoning ordinance that prohibits uh, bushes from grow allowing being allowed to grow more than three feet within 25 feet of the intersection would apply in this case. Carolyn, you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> um, yes, there is a site triangle um, requirement in the zoning. So if we have the dimension I mean, that could be an enforcement issue with the for the building department that could be submitted to the building department for that. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. And and just uh, one final comment on that. We sort of chased this all over the city. Um, the way the city's ordinances are written is that um, we notify the property owner and we ask them to remedy the situation. If they don't, the city does it for them. Um, and then bills them, um, but it's a very difficult um, it's a very difficult uh, process and enforcement around it. Um, Betty, I see your hand up. I'll unmute you again. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just want to point out: is that three eleven um, stand? Is that are, you, are you looking for clarification on the yeah. the address? Is I I don't know the house number. I I don't either. It's the house at at the corner. Uh, right next to me. Uh, yeah, uh, you know. Director Anyways. Lascaia, it's the corner coming uh, on the other side of Cook Avenue. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. So outbound yes. on the left. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make note that the house on the corner recently had a big old oak tree taken down, and today he uh, was cutting back some of the bushes on the side of the house. Oh, interesting. And we in the neighborhood would gladly cut down anything if it would help see. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that comment. I'll take a ride through there and um, and see what that looks like. Devin, go ahead. Um, I appreciate. Uh, Councillor Jarrett's 
knowledge of the zoning ordinance. And I think it's great if we would provide that ordinance number to Councillor Moulton, because if I got a call from my counselor and it was explained to me the effect of, you know, what the what the uh, ordinance said, I think it would be impressive. So uh, that information is useful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. We'll do a little more reconnaissance on this. Okay, any further discussion on this? Okay, so we have a motion for a positive recommendation on the floor. Uh, Beth, could you please call the roll? Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Adam? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Passes unanimously, unanimously with 10. Thank you, Beth. Okay, next up is a discussion of a parking request for Cook Avenue and Pines Edge Drive. Um, the uh, thought behind putting this on the agenda was that we'd have folks from the neighborhood here for the last agenda item, um, and we just wanted to capture um, all of this at the same time. So this was a parking request that came to us last year, um, and uh, the comment is that overflow parking is spilling out onto Cook Avenue and the intersection of Pines Edge, uh, Pines Edge and Cook Avenue becomes congested. Um, so there's no vote on anything today. It's just a discussion. Um, we just we're hoping to hear some comments from uh, folks in the neighborhood um, who might be able to just explain a little better what's uh, what their experience is up here. Um, I will ask Carolyn, would you mind just commenting on the work your department has done up here and how that may or may not impact us? Sure. So. Um... You know, last year when we were getting some of these comments, there was, um, you know, um, more, there had been some more activity at this entrance for um, the Fitzgerald Lake access. Uh, however, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we have just, as part of the whole acquisition of this parcel um, and the planning and design for the reuse of this, we have created um, and built a just a 20 um, space parking lot, which has just been completed, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, and is open as of this afternoon. Um, so that's many more parking spaces than, and it's because it's striped, people will park in designated spaces, whereas before it was just sort of a wide open gravel area. And having that lack of definition for parking. Um, would tend to fill up more quickly um, in a, you know, um, sort of disorganized way. And that tends to push people then out on the street. So, you know, I think it would make sense to sort of think about this, um, to sort of look at this, um, maybe um, let this sit a little bit and see what the effect of this new parking lot now with defined spaces has on any kind of pressure that's on the street um, in this neighborhood. Okay, thanks, Carolyn, appreciate it. Um, and I think Maggie's gonna um, get a map up for us so we can kind of visualize the area. Um, in the meantime, uh, Pat, I see your hand up, I'll unmute you, go ahead. Um, good afternoon, I'm Pat O'Reilly. I am live on Pines Edge Drive. I am the person who submitted this request on behalf of the, bo the uh, Board of Trustees for Pines Edge. The first thing I would, <clears throat> sorry, the first thing I would like to point out is the fact that this diagram does not represent the request. Uh, the diagram is accurate with the request as far as what we asked for, for a no parking zone on um, Cook Avenue. When it comes to Pines Edge Drive, the request was for the no parking zone to be on the opposite side of Pines Edge Drive, up past the hydrant, which you can see is a red dot at the top of the diagram, and up to the second entrance to the parking lot at the first building, which is what the parking lot that's listed there. Um, what has been done at the entrance to the Broadbrook Coalition Trails at 196 is wonderful. 
there is uh, definitely marked spaces there. Um, however, before there were no marked spaces anywhere and there was more of an area where people could park. Um, people have been asked in the notice to make sure that they don't park where the section that isn't paved has been seeded so grass can grow. Um, our concern is the fact that when the lot is blocked off, and which again, it will be in the future for when they um, build, hopefully there, the city is planning on selling off um, an area that has four um, housing houses that they were hoping that Habitat for Humanity, I believe, um, might purchase and build. Um, anytime that the parking lot is blocked off, I will say I'm very happy with what the city did this time with blocking off the parking lot totally for a month. The no parking signs that were put up by the um, police department were wonderful. Um, we did not have people coming up here, but the no parking signs covered the area over which we were asking for um, some permanent no parking signs in the future. Our biggest concern is the inability of emergency vehicles to get up into our condo complex when there is parking. Um, when people have... Um, the, limp, the parking of 21 spaces is wonderful, but they get filled up. We're going to be concerned about people parking on both sides of Pines Edge and or Cook Avenue and therefore blocking access of emergency vehicles, which we have witnessed in the, in the past. Um, with the new paved lot and spaces, um, I can understand wanting to look at this in the future and seeing how things go. Um, we are, however, concerned with the fact of emergency vehicle access when it's needed. We have um, full contingent of ages in our condo complex. We do have quite a few of us that have actually been there for 30 plus years and um, have concerns about getting help if we need it, if the space is, if the street gets blocked with parking. Um, yeah, my biggest concern at the that. moment is the fact that the diagram is not correct. Yeah, thank you, Kat. I appreciate those comments. And I'll just, um, I, I have uh, a, an explanation for that. Uh, again, this is just a, um, a, a map for discussion. In general, when we implement no parking zones, we try to have consistency. We don't like them to be um, sort of disjointed. It, it's less confusing for folks um, when they're parking to have sort of a continuous um, stretch um, where they can't park rather than sort of jogs we use that for traffic calming in certain places you know well no parking here no parking on the other side of the street um in some situations we try to make continuous no parking zones though i don't know nancy can you just kind of comment on what your enforcement experience is in places um where you know we have kind of non-continuous zones um if we were to sort of hopscotch across the street here can you can you just comment for us on that uh, we have always found that a, a continuous no parking zone is um, uh, works better, is more successful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that um, clarification. Um, anyone on the commission have any comments on this um, before we go back to Pat? Councilor Jarrett, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment in the context of the previous uh, agenda item. And that the the more that it is that folks feel safe walking or bicycling through that intersection and can access the conservation area with that way, the less parking pressure uh, we may have. So so I think uh, <clears throat> there could be a you know if we, if we the there there could be complementary solutions. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. Appreciate that. Any other members of the commission have any comments? Um, Pat, I'll unmute you in a second. Um, my question for you would be, can you describe to us specifically where you think the no parking zone should be? And, and just if you could explain uh, a little bit more, that would be very helpful. Um, yes, our con well, my concern personally with having what would be referred to as the continuous no parking zone 
is the fact that the fire hydrant for the first building is on the other side of the street for Pine Sage Drive um, <clears throat> and to extend the no parking zones up. We have had to put up, um, this is private property, no parking at both entrances to the parking lot for this first building to keep people, try to keep people from parking in the parking lot for the residents in the first building. Um, and by, like, it helped. We felt it would be that we have also witnessed people block, excuse me, blocking the fire hydrant for the first building. So um, hence the request to have it on the opposite side of the street. Um, and also feeling that having it up Cook Avenue where it is on the diagram and then on the opposite side of Pine Sage Drive um, would be a better angle for any emergency vehicles for trying to get around the turn from Cook Avenue into Pine Sedge Drive. Great, appreciate that clarification, thank you. Um, Kim, you're next, go ahead. I think we're having trouble unmuting you. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Kim. Okay. Um, one thing that's not being mentioned here that the um, board didn't look at and uh, hasn't mentioned, I live on Pines Edge Drive again, have for 30 years. The no parking signs that have been up have been excellent. They've worked wonders. And I haven't seen any violations of that. I think we need to have no parking signs on both sides of the road. And what hasn't been mentioned is when you come down from Pines Edge Drive, there is a long curve in the road. So you're looking downhill and the sight lines will be blocked if there's parking allowed on one side. That means that you have to drive into oncoming traffic if you're taking a left onto Cook Ave or taking a right onto Pines Edge Drive. So I think no parking signs on both sides of the road are needed for a certain expanse on Cook and Pines Edge Drive. Um, otherwise we have a problem with avoiding oncoming traffic. Um, and, and additionally, um, the new parking lot is creating a heat island, which is something that the city has approved to do in our environment. But um, if barriers could be put up where the grass has been planted so people who want to park in that lot and don't have space and don't want to go to another um, hiking area, they will park in that grass that's just been planted. So I think a barrier has to be put up there until the, um, hopefully the knotweed will be cut down for habitat and they can start building. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kim. Adam, go ahead. Hi. Um, okay, so it's my understanding here that the that the parking lot is newly completed but not yet opened. Is that correct? It's open. It's open today. Um, just open today. It just opened today. So there's not really any way to understand the effect that the that the now additional parking has on this situation. Is that right? Also. Yeah. That that would right. be accurate. Go ahead, Carolyn. Okay. So I, I feel. You know, at this point with that in play, and then we're hearing about the sort of speculative development that may occur additional to that property sometime in the future, like with the city selling off some of it for Habitat for Humanity or some other kind of development, but that's down the road a ways. It, it just seems to me to, to do anything with like a permanent no parking area in this place at this time um, it just seems premature because we don't actually know what the conditions are uh, in the immediate future. So to me, this just seems like something that we should revisit in a year or two if it's necessary. Um, and that's my comment. Yeah, thanks, Adam. All right, Pat, I see um, your hand up. So I'll meet you. Go ahead. Um 
the reason we did not ask for parking on both sides of Pine Sage Drive is because we felt that if we had no parking signs on both sides of both roads, that also impedes the access of emergency vehicles. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Any other comments, Carolyn, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to clarify the current, currently the code doesn't, it does restrict parking within, I can't remember, three to five feet of an intersecting street, correct? So already the corner around Cook and Pine's Edge should be prohibited parking. Is that right? Yeah, 20 feet. Yeah. 20 feet. 20 okay. feet. So in either direction, that's already the case. Okay. Right. That that area um, really does have a lot of um, existing no parking areas because you're talking about 20 feet from an intersection, 10 feet from a fire hydrant, um, three feet from driveways. So there are already in place a lot of no parking zones on that side. Devin, go ahead. Uh, just a short comment that I actually prefer the no parking on the south side of that street where it's indicated now, partly because coming down that hill on uh, on the on the edge drive, uh, Pines Edge Drive, uh, it, it, if the cars are, I, I actually prefer it there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Devin. All right. Any other members of the commission have any comments? Kim, I see your hand up. I just want to make sure. Anyone else have any comments? All right, Kim, go ahead again. Hold on, I'm just having trouble unmuting you. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. So if we see people parking within three feet of the entrance to the parking lot or within, um, what was it, 25 feet of the intersection, we can call the, what is it, Devin? It, it's Party. dispatch, yeah, it's dispatch. So it's 20 feet of an intersection, 10 feet of a higher fire hydrant or three feet of a driveway. Okay, so then we can call the police and they will come and ticket? That's correct. Okay, we're gonna be doing that. Okay, thank you. All right, so again, not a vote on this, um, just wanted to have a discussion about it and kind of hear um, people's experience and comments. So we appreciate that feedback. Um, I do agree that the parking lot is gonna have some level of effect on this. It's unclear what, if any, effect it will have. Um, Cindy, can you please put our email address in the chat for folks um, and I would encourage um, people from the neighborhood to please uh, send us feedback. Um, maybe, you know, wait a few weeks and, and kind of let things settle out a little bit. And if you could send us feedback on what your experience is, we would be interested to hear um, what, if anything, has changed. Um, and Cindy, if you could throw that in the chat, that would be great. So thank you. Any further discussion on this uh, from anyone in the commission? Okay, and our email address is in the chat. So again, we encourage uh, people to email us and let us know what you're seeing. Okay, moving on, we have a proposed ordinance for stop signs in the vicinity of Smith College. So as part of the Smith College pedestrian improvements that I talked about in my update, there are several stop signs that are proposed on side streets intersecting West Street and Elm Street. Um, so I will read the ordinance. So this is an ordinance relative to stop signs in the vicinity of Smith College. So we recommend that section 312-113 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-113, Schedule 12, stop and yield in intersections, isolated stop signs. Stop intersections are established at the following locations. Location, Owaga Avenue, direction of travel southeast at the intersection of West Street, Arnold Avenue, direction of travel east at the intersection of West Street, Belmont Avenue, direction of travel southeast at the intersection of West Street, Green Street, direction of travel east at the intersection of West Street, 
and Henshaw Avenue, direction of travel south at the intersection of Elm Street. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? So moved, Nancy. Devin seconds. Okay, thank you. And um, just a, a couple of points of clarification here. Um, Green Street already has a stop sign in the ground, um, but it is not in the ordinance. So I, I mentioned that Smith College had generously paid for a study of the entire area and is now funding uh, improvements. Um, part of the comprehensive evaluation that Foss and O'Neill did of this corridor was an assessment of stop controls at various intersections. Um, sometimes we have discrepancies between what the ordinance says and what's in the field and vice versa. Um, so that's one of these stop signs. Um, and the rest um, are recommended to be stop controlled intersections. Um, so that is the explanation of this ordinance. So any comments or questions from anyone? Um, Councillor Jarrett, go ahead. Yeah, just so I can explain at City Council, is, is the reasoning uh, that they, they meet warrants for sight lines, for traffic counts, et cetera? Yeah, so this is, so this is um, actually Fox and O'Neill's um, engineering judgment of the entire corridor and in making comprehensive improvements to the entire corridor. Um, the traffic volumes on both Route 66 and Route 9 are significant, um, and these are all intersecting streets um, uh, with uh, Route 66 primarily. Um, so it's Fuss and O'Neill's engineering judgment that there should be stop signs here. Um, interestingly, there's actually like stop bars that were painted in some of these locations, but there's no stop sign in the field. Um, like I said, Green Street has already got a stop sign up and it's just not in the ordinances. So at some point, you know, if you look at the aerial map of this, you can sort of see the stop bars and like there's no stop sign, you know, so um, it, 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 we're trying to sort of correct, I, I think, um, historical, um, you know, uh, differences between what's in the field and, and, um, and what's in the ordinance. Thank you. Sure. Any other comments on this? Councilor Clemmer, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just want to thank uh, Smith for helping out with this. I know there were a couple accidents um, recently there, and it is a really, really busy intersection. I drive down it you know, a few times a day probably. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think the stop signs will, will help hopefully um, alleviate some of the uh, congestion and issues going on. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. And, and again, we're really taking a comprehensive look at this area with, you know, with this change, you know, the installation of the signage and then the installation of the RRFDs at various crosswalks. Um, I think it's going to make a market difference in this entire corridor. Go ahead, Devin. Um, I just want to mention that the crosswalk that is at Green Avenue, the the sidewalk on the library side of the street is in it's crumbled. It's in very bad shape. So I don't know if that could get looked at in the same vein, but it's it's uh, a, a tripping hazard, if you would. Yeah. Thanks, Devin. Any other comments on the proposed ordinance for us? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Beth, if you could call the roll, please. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Adam? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. And Jamie? Yes. Another passage unanimously with 10. Okay, thank you, Beth. Next is a proposed ordinance relative to driving or parking on grassy areas adjoining street. Prohibited. Sorry, I'm reading off the agenda and it's um, a little bit of a word salad. Um, but what we are seeking to do is author uh, Section 312 76 of the Code of Ordinances to prohibit parking um, on the grass surface of any public 
parking lot or public driveway. So we're looking to make a very specific change to an existing ordinance. Um, Carolyn, can you just hop in and talk a little bit about um, what we're trying to accomplish there? Sure. Um, so because we have this specific um, parking prohibition along streets, so you can't pull up off of a street and, and park um, in the grass, we wanted to make sure that extended to public um, public parks and other driveways. And in particular, this has come up quite a bit at um, our Connecticut Greenway Park, where um, people are not parking in the designated spaces, but they're instead finding spaces all over and ruining the um, grass or the landscaped areas of, of the park. Um, and someone pointed out um, in the previous conversation about the new parking lot at the end of um, Cook Avenue. Um, yes, we want to make sure we can um, prohibit parking there as well. Um, and it's one of those things where it's sort of unfortunate that we have to tell people to act um, responsibly because um, um, people sometimes don't have good judgment about um, making those decisions about where it might be inappropriate to park. Um, so really, it's it's um, those are sort of two examples of um, what this ordinance is um, attempting to address. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. And just to be clear, the ordinance is um, is on the screen, and um, I, I apologize that it's not in track changes, um, but the language, the specific language that is being added, is the very last sentence so at the bottom of the page where it says or any public parking lot or public driveway that is the that is the new addition to this ordinance so that's that is the only thing in the ordinance that we're seeking to change so when this does go to council we will send it as a track change um, so that, so that it can be seen uh, councillor i'm not sure if that was your question yeah thank you Okay, so may I have a motion for a positive recommendation for this, please? Move to approve. That's Carolyn. May I have a second? I second it. Okay, Councillor Clemmer seconds. Any further discussion on this? Okay, hearing none. Um, sorry, I uh, I was premature and should have asked if there's any comments from the public, and I did not. So my apologies, uh, Brett. I see your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, thanks all. Um, I am just curious, I, I understand that this is not the part of the ordinance that you are proposing changing, um, but I'm curious if uh, a vehicle of any description, does that include bicycles? Um, Brett, can you just state your last name for the record, if you would? Sorry, yeah, Brett Constantine, Florence Mass. Okay, thank you. Um, Carolyn, I'm going to defer to you on that. So, um, I think that, um, I'm, I don't know if specifically the code says that it is an interesting discussion. Um, I would think that we don't necessarily want vehicles, um, parked on, you know, we would want bicycle parking to be located where we've designated bicycle parking or on a hardscape area so it doesn't um, tear up the turf. But I'm um, just checking the code to confirm if there's a definition of um, vehicle that would address that. And I think what we can do is before this goes to council um, or when it gets referred out to legislative matters, we can provide that clarification. Any other comments? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor for positive recommendation. Hearing no further discussion, uh, Beth, can you call the roll, please? Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Adam? Uh, 
Adam, are you still here? Adam, oh, you're yes. Muted. You're muted. Okay. Uh, Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. Jamie? Yes. 10 yeses, unanimously approved. Thank you, Beth. Okay, last agenda item is a proposed ordinance relative to EV charging at parking meter locations. Um, there is a lot going on here, and I am going to turn this over to uh, Ben, um, the Kappa director, who has joined us. So, Ben, take it away. Hi. Would it be all right for me to share my screen? Uh, it would. We're going to have to make you a co-host, so just bear with us okay. for a second. Uh, uh, just, just because I, I, before we got into the mess, I thought I'd try and um, uh, uh, explain, give a background for it. Yep, sure. Um, yeah, so give me one second here. <laughs> uh, something like this. All right, so um, so currently we don't charge to charge and, and that is uh, potentially a, a problem. So the current policy has some problems that I'm gonna go over. The pr primary one is that we have unrecouped costs. The cost to drivers is $0, but the city is spending uh, about uh, $44,500 per year most of that is in giving away free electricity to uh, EV drivers, but there's also a fee to just operate the charging network, which is something that accrues to all of us. Um, there are also, the way that we're currently operating it, there's some transactional friction that provides, I think, frustration for users, but also um, burdens parking enforcement unnecessarily. So currently the user has to use a charge point app or a credit card or a uh, RFID card or something to charge. And then they have to use a separate app or go to a kiosk to pay for parking. So you're doing two actions to park. Um, and of course, therefore the parking uh, enforcement has to look at both systems. So that adds burden to them. Um, I'd say even more importantly, there are perverse incentives. So when you give something away for free, it changes the way people value it. So an EV driver, if they see an empty port, whether or not their battery is anywhere near uh, discharged will fill up what they can because it's free. It's certainly cheaper than charging at home where you're paying whatever your electric rate is. If you overstay, you get a $25 ticket, but that's a static charge, which means that once you have gotten that ticket, you no longer have a new incentive to leave. <laughs> um, and so it kind of acts as a permission structure. Um, and then finally, the parking-based time limits, which makes sense for trying to move to create availability of spaces for parking, actually uh, reduces the value for an EV driver who might be coming, say, from out of town and really needs to top their battery all the way up in order to get to their final destination. Um, so the proposed policy would be to charge a price sufficient to recoup costs, to eliminate time limits for EVs while charging, and make overstay penalties dynamic, and would use the charge point device itself to do all of this. So it would collect EV charging fees, um, and I'll go into a minute how I arrived at $2.50 an hour and why we're charging by the hour and not by the kilowatt hour. Um, then it would charge overstay penalties after a grace period um, of 25 cents per minute. So that means that every minute that you stay has the same incentive for you to leave. Um, and then you would collect the parking fees using the charge point infrastructure rather than the city's uh, park mobile and kiosk infrastructure which then reduces um, uh, transaction friction. Operationally, it would make sense to make parking enforcement the primary operator of the charge point network. All fees collected would go to parking enforcement and then just as they do with other fees, they, it would um, be returned to the general fund after parking enforcement expenses. At least that's how I understand that it works. 
Um, and then therefore the only tickets that parking enforcement would have to write are those for non-EVs parked in EV spaces. Um, so how I came at pricing was mainly to find our break-even price. And our break-even price is basically 34 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, but because of variations in the speeds of charging, speeds of vehicles, and to allow for kind of simplicity for the users, uh, both recommendations from ChargePoint and from other uh, users has been to turn that into an hourly charge. Um, but you can see that charge pricing or in the area is all over the map, but our $2.50 is somewhere in the middle. And is this kind of fair? Uh, it is a better price than what you're paying for gasoline. So it still benefits the EV driver to be driving an EV compared to um, in, an internal combustion engine car. So that is the... Um, the motivation behind it. And I don't know if uh, if you want to discuss the motivation or if you want me to kind of walk through what I've tried to do with the ordinance to enable this. I, I think, Ben, if you could just describe to us um, how the ordinance is altered, because I do need to ask for a motion um, to alter the ordinance. So if you could just explain the specific um, changes that have been made to 312-36, that would be helpful. Okay. So I've highlighted the parts of the ordinance that exist, which demonstrate that any device can be used to collect um, parking meters. So therefore the charge point equipment is available to use it. Um, so then we look through the ordinance, we see that it's kind of a table of, of prices that have already been established. So for EV one, uh, one, two, three, four, all, all of these class of EV parking sites, basically I have kept the exact parking cost per hour uh, paid in, in exactly the same way that it is in the same area. Um, and then I've added the $2.50 per hour for EV charging, and then the details about how e once EV charging is stopped charging, there's a 15-minute grace period. All of that is administered through the app from a practical standpoint. After the grace period of an overstay penalty of 25 cents per minute is charged, and the EV charging fee and overstay penalty is applied 24 hours and seven days a week, so that there's no confusion with the time span during which charging for parking is um, is managed. And basically, that same uh, uh, cost or that the, the same language has been added to each class with the different. Uh, prices per hour as they vary in the existing uh, ordinance. That's what I got. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate the presentation. Um, any comments or questions for Ben? Carolyn, go ahead. Um, so Ben, can you just um, confirm? So all the, so the parking fee and the charging rate are all um, collected by the app, the ChargePoint app, so that um, that's wrapped into one and that reduces the um, PEO's um, need to check. They're just checking to make sure that it is an EV car parked in the EV space and charging. That is the plan. The, the, okay. That yes, the revenue still goes to parking enforcement, but and and they have the ability. They we our plan is for us to hand over management of of the app to them, and you know, with some training for them. But that it's it's theirs. Um, but there really should be nothing. The app should manage uh, the, the pricing and so forth. Councilor Jarrett, go ahead. So there would also be a ticket if your EV was there but not charging. Well, there's, not there's, a built in. In, there's a built in tick. Oh, if it's there but not charging, that's a really good point. So you just parked there, but you didn't you didn't plug it in and you didn't uh, 
do the charge point app in that case uh at the very least you are not paying for parking so so you haven't paid for parking and um but i think it would be uh, i'd ask for some advice on this but it seems like uh you would want to write so i wrote non evs <laughs> and we should actually write vehicles that are not plugged in <laughs> or something something much more explicit you're, connected you're right. to the charge point network yeah that, that, that you're right that. that is the detail thanks Devin, go ahead hi ben um i have had conversations with will coffee and and with uh nancy forstall about the parking lot behind forbes which is not it's it's city meters, but the money goes to the library, but it is a private lot in that it's owned by the trustees. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, first off, I like your idea of fixing the charging problem for its duration. And I had talked to people at Cooley Dickinson about how their charging usage is going, and it's not going well for them. The neighborhood comes in, parks the cars, and they've even had cars that are not EVs take the plug and put it at the car to make it look like it's in charging when it has no ability to charge. So I think you it's a complicated thing, but I hope once you get the uh, charge point process worked out, we will piggyback right on top of you and put a couple of chargers behind the library. Thank you. So this is um, uh, tangential, but I actually had a discussion with Lisa. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bad at last Downing. Name. Downing. Um, because you own the lot, you own the, the parking, it's it essentially, it's entirely separate from the city. Um, it was a simple matter for me to connect them to a free resource <laughs> to get you EV charging. Uh, and that is something that you can administer entirely on your own. Well, what well, we wanted to do though, was make sure we were compatible with the city system so if you wanted to have a dpw or a or a public utility you know it, so that it was all one system yeah it it would be so there's uh, it's details but basically there's a sub account on okay. the same account and you guys would control it um but that's all kind of like mechanics of okay it. thank you i'll if i i'll get offline with you sometime and catch up yeah thanks Devin. Any other comments on this ordinance? So we have uh, Councilor Clemmer, go ahead. Um, yeah, my hand's really hard to see on there. So but, um, yeah, so when the car finishes charging, does the app automatically um, charge the person or does the uh, person, the DPW person have to go around and- oh, uh, No, the app does it. Yeah. So basically when, when the car finishes charging, the app does two things it sends you a push notification that your car has finished charging. And because we can change the settings on it, it would, if we all agree that this is the way it would go, you have 15 minutes to remove your car. After that, you will start being charged 25 cents per minute uh, because you have finished, your car has finished charging. Um, so it gives you the notification and then, then you have to leave. You aren't, the final charging is not processed until the car is disconnected from the um, from the charger. Okay, so it's like the parking apps that tell you you have a few minutes left. Right, like it's you, yeah, the same. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. Thank you. All right, Nancy, go ahead. I'm concerned about some conflicting city ordinances that are already in place. Um, I'm also I, I have a concern about um, Park Mobile and any agreements that we have with Park Mobile that they will be the payment app. Um, so I I feel like we need to have some more internal discussions. Um, I am absolutely in support of the idea of um, charging pay, uh, charging to charge. Um, and it is a, a excessive amount that has fallen on the city's shoulders to pay for this. Um, but I, 
I think that we need to do a little more cleaning up um, as far as the ordinances and any conflicting ordinances that may also be in place. Um, because we do have ordinances that talk about um, must be an EV vehicle, um, must be actively charging. Um, so we do have a, a few conflicting ordinances here. Um, and I just want to make sure that everything is clean. That's all. I um, think that, I mean, that's in this ordinance. So so it's got its own separate line. Here, I'll, I'll reshare my screen so you can just see the, the ordinance itself. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are other conflicts, but this one, so each one of these has a class. It says restricted to electric field while charging. And then I'm supplementing the detail where they pay for parking with the amount that they pay for charging. So I think, is that the conflicting ordinance? Because I think that's in there. Um, oh, and I forgot to to show two things that I also wanted to add, uh, but actually that needs to be modified. So I said non-EV, but um, uh, uh, Councillor Jarrett pointed out that people can be tricky, so we need to clean that up to be um, vehicle not actually connected. Um, and then I did want to add uh, the ability of the mayor to develop regulations to set uh to, to make changes just just because prices change if for no other reason than that but um it, was that the conflict you were talking about or is there a different one right the the fact that it must be an ev there's already an ordinance in place that states must be an ev vehicle must be actively charging and must pay to park so I just want to make sure that we don't have anything that conflicts and that, in fact, we withdraw um, the existing ordinance that says that. So I just want to be careful that we're not conflicting in the message that we're putting out there. I guess I don't see the, the conflict between, that seems like that ordinance is upheld in this one, where you have to pay to park and the cost for parking is contained in the price for mm -hmm. charging. Yeah, Ben, mm -hmm. sometimes there are um, multiple ordinances that talk about the same thing. Um, so what we have to do anytime we make a new ordinance is we have to go through the existing code and we have to check to make sure that there is not redundant commentary on the same topic in an unexpected place in the code of ordinances that would be in conflict with something that is being proposed. And this happens a lot, um, particularly in matters that come before this commission. We have two parts of the code that say something completely different and that leads to confusion. Um, so that's just uh, a little. Okay, so this is a general concern that there might be, but, but we aren't identifying any parts of the code now that do conflict right i just want to i'm just asking that we we are very careful that we clean up any other ordinances that may already be self-standing that would conflict with anything right. that's being proposed i just want to make sure that we're not leaving the problem for further on down the line right. that's all so due diligence basically uh, there's there's additional scanning the code okay um so then my question for you is about the next part of the process um is it that somebody me a non-lawyer has to go scan the code hope that i find all of the potential conflicts and come back to the tpc next month or is it possible to say something along the lines the tpc approves the general direction of this and would like the mayor's office to do the due diligence and move it to the next stage. Um, Carolyn, do you, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's a matter of just putting the search terms in the code and scrubbing it and looking for any reference to it. So I don't think that's, um, that, that can be done fairly in a fairly straightforward way and I, certainly to your question Ben I think it would make sense that you know this committee could make a motion and to have this move forward because it has, has to be 
officially introduced. And then by that time, you can clean up any inconsistencies. Um, if this committee votes on, um, you know, to approve this direction, I guess. That's it. I, well, my other comment is that if there are in fact conflicts, um, and it, it is certainly possible that there are, we see it all the time and it's not an unusual scenario, we would want to move um, revisions to all or all affected ordinances as a package, um, because otherwise it's it it sort of wastes council's time. Um, so we want to move everything as one. Um, and so I, I think that we would want to work through that process and then bring everything to council simultaneously. Um, so I think we've had a good discussion here this afternoon um, and certainly would not need to repeat that discussion, um, but that this ordinance could be reintroduced next month um, and it, at that point, we could move it forward. Nancy, do you um, have a comment? Yes. I mean, I don't want my concern to hold this up, and I would withdraw that. I was simply asking that we be cognizant of anything that may conflict with it. I cannot off the top of my head say that there is a definite conflict of any sort, so I would withdraw my concern. So in that case, do you need like a, a motion to um, recommend that this move forward to be introduced to city council? Um, Devin, go ahead. Um, I'm going to try the wording of a motion and just see if it suits us. Um, I move we approve the motion, the uh, ordinance changes that we have reviewed today with consideration for a review of the other ordinance to make sure there's no conflict so that we can indicate to Ben and the council that we like this approach and we will do our due diligence on any other things that could conflict. <laughs> okay, that's that's a good uh, that's a good motion. I'm gonna just hold that for a second, and I have a question for the councilors uh, on the meeting. Um, councilors Jarrett and or Clemmer. Um, if we were to approve this, if we were to just make a, a straight motion for a positive recommendation on this as amended um, and approve that, could I hold that, can I hold off on sending that to the council until we've had an opportunity to scan the code and be certain that there's no conflicts? Could I hold it or is there like a statutory time limit that I have to release it to the council? That question makes sense. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to take that. I, I don't believe that there is. We've certainly had uh, recommendations from <clears throat> transportation and parking that did not come immediately at the next meeting. Um, <clears throat> so so we we in the council have a process that once we introduce, there are certain and then refer out, there are certain time limits, but I don't know of any from items that are generated by TPC. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. And I don't know of any time limits either. And you're correct. There's definitely um, been recommendations that that have lagged in getting to the council from TPC. Um, so my comment on this would be that we could simplify Devin's motion um, to just uh, have a motion for a positive recommendation on this ordinance as amended. Um, and then I will hold it if it is a positive recommendation, I will hold it and not release it to the council until we work through um, just our internal vetting. And and that would be my suggestion. Uh, Carolyn, I see you unmuted. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would work. That Yeah. I just never muted from last time. Not like okay. it was up All right. Sorry. <laughs> Calling you. Councilor Jarek, go ahead. Yeah, I would just ask, you know, the version that we have here is not there's no changes tracked. So it was a little unclear to me what was being changed. So there were some things I couldn't, I didn't, wasn't clear. Uh, so I just ask that it it be in track changes when it comes to council. Okay, sure, we can, yeah. 
we can make. I think it was the what stuff on the screen was track changes, but the stuff that yes. didn't that came was not. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we can we can be certain of that. And I think Nancy, we can to um, alleviate your concerns, which I actually share. Um, we can certainly work through whatever we need to work through with the vendor um, to uh, around our obligations to them um, before this gets released. So I guess I would ask, is there a motion for a positive recommendation on ordinance 312-36 as amended? I would move. Second it, Devin. Okay, so Carolyn makes the motion, Devin seconds. Councillor Jarrett, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to be clear what the amendment was. Did, did we come up with specific language or it was about um not just non not just evs but evs not just non-evs but any vehicle that's not connected to the to the charging network was that that that's what we're referring to when we say as amended yeah oh i'm yeah i'm sorry i misspoke uh what i was saying is um the changes to um 312-36 i don't believe that we have um addressed the concerns about non-ev um uh vehicles so i would move to uh, um amend my motion to um include the um clarification that it's for um non uh, vehicles that are not connected to the charge network and that'll be again reflected in the language, which will be in track changes, um, which will go to council. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Ben. For what it's worth, I I just modified that in the version, so I can I can just send you the the updated version. Okay, thank you. It was a fast amendment. Do I need to second the modified? That was my question to Councillor Jarrett is we have a, a, so yes, we need to second that. Second. Uh, was that Devin again? Yes. yes. And what is exactly is it saying now? Positive recommendation on the ordinance. As amended. It's, it is saying as amended, mm -hmm. but not with any more detail on that. Right. Great. Thank you. Are we ready for a vote? Okay, that's my question is, is there any further discussion on this? Um, so to be clear, um, we will be uh, voting to make a recommendation on this ordinance as amended. Um, we will do uh, some internal um, uh, conversations around, are there conflicts uh, with other sections of the ordinance? We will confirm that there's no conflicts with our vendor. And then this will be released to council once we've completed those tasks. And Councillor Jarrett, so that you're prepared to speak to this, we'll um, we'll follow up by um, by email so that so that you know that that's been accomplished. Thank you. Sure. Any further discussion on this? Okay. Hearing none. Beth, please call the roll. Donna. Yes. John. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Nancy. Yes. Alex. Yes. Deborah. Yes. Adam. Yes. Devin. Yes. And Diana is gone. Diana has left us. Yes. And Jamie. Yes. So that is now uh, nine yes votes. Okay. Thank you, Beth. All right. Is there any new business? Hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, that was Councillor Clemmer with a second by Carolyn. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Beth, roll call, please. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Adam? Yes. Devin? Yes. And Jamie? Yes. 
nine yeses. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Stay thanks cool. Well. See you Thank next you. month. Take care. Bye-bye.